Welcome to Journeys in Journals. We're on the Pioneer Trail, I mean really, really, a long time ago, and my guest is uh, one of those descendants who can tell us all about coming on the Oregon Trail and then the Applegate no, just Trail. the Applegate Trail. They didn't take any Oregon Trail. The reason that they didn't go on the Oregon Trail, there's a tragic well, story. You could say they come on the Oregon Trail, too, because as far as Fort Hall, Idaho, and that's where the Applegate Trail forked off the Oregon they Trail. They split. So they actually did come part way on the Oregon Trail. Some. And Fort Hall, Idaho took the Applegate Trail on to Oregon and the Willamette Valley. and. The Oregon. Oregon Trail has some real sad stories as far as the Applegate family, right? Right, yeah, because when the people come on the Oregon Trail, they wound up having to come down the Columbia River and they had to make rafts and float the wagons through the Columbia River Gorge and it nearly ever trip somebody drowned. And when the Applegate, Jesse and Lindsay Applegate come out in 1843, they lost two nine-year-old boys and an uncle. So it was them. Heartbreaking. Pardon? That's heartbreaking. Oh, I'll tell you that, yeah, just about killed them. And then they got to the Willamette Valley, though, and got their land claims and got cabins on them, and, and three years it took them to get organized. And then they, 1846, they took about a, 10 men from up there and a real famous mountain man that knew the country well by the name of Levi Scott and said that we're going to find a southern way to Oregon that we don't, people don't drown. That you don't have to go on the Columbia River. Don't have to go on the Columbia River. No. And where did they go? Well, they come from the Willamette Valley, if you could visualize like up around Requiel, right down through here, right through where Grants Pass is now, through Medford, through Ashland, neither one of them, none of them were there then, and then over the mountain to Klamath Falls, that direction. And, and n there were no towns, no nothing at that time. Right. And, and from Klamath Falls, then they headed east across the Black Rock Desert and hit the the Oregon Trail at Fort Hall, Idaho. So that part was known, the Fort Hall trip, but these guys were making trail. They were making trail. And they were making trail from the west to the east, right? They were- Yeah, to, to, to get there and then come back. And what did they do when they got to Fort Hall? Well, they picked up about 100 wagons that was there on the, going on the Oregon Trail and talked them into coming back their way, which was a, a almost disastrous trip because there was nothing but a horseback trail. And, and they had to come through with wagons. And of course, it was uh, extremely rough because of nothing, you know. To, but they got through and got to the Willamette Valley and people kept coming that way. And for the next 34 years, they come on the Applegate Trail and more people actually settled the Oregon Territory over the Applegate Trail than they did over the Oregon Trail. That's an interesting bit of history. Yeah. Now, I've been through a place called Canyonville. Yeah. Now, that, I'm told, was the worst well, of the Applegate that, Trail. That, that was the worst, yes. From the top of Canyon Creek Pass down to Canyonville, they just followed right along Canyon Creek and it was just a totally rock bank that was straight. Like this? Yeah, straight, no road. And they had to cut trees, they had to make road. And, and actually, when they got through the Canyon Creek Pass, the only thing that was left out of all the wagons was one fella had the front axle and wheels with the tongue on it and he had his stuff tied on the axle, the rest of them were either walking, riding horses, or whatever. They had nothing left. And one fellow even had uh, carefully brought a couple of hives of bees from back east to get started in the sure. bee honey business. And his wagon tipped over in the creek and all the bees drowned. <laughs> he lost it all. Oh no, yeah. after the, all that way. I hear that that when you drive from Canyon Summit yeah. down into Canyonville, next time think about this narrow, there was no oh, trail. Yeah. 
they had to be in the creek. Yeah, they some places they was just in the rock boulders along the edge. Some places running water. Some places could get on ground a little. And I. But, but they eventually hewed a road out there and and they, got it leveled down and and in time, then of course, uh, hundreds of wagons went over it and eventually got it good enough that even the California Oregon stage line run over that same road. And I understand it was a toll road. You paid money uh, to get into Canyonville. Not to my knowledge, the uh, the Barlow Road up was a toll road. Ah. Yeah. So if you But that was up way up out of Portland coming in that way. Ah. They had a toll road. Then there was a toll road up on uh, the Siskiyous, but that wasn't part of the um, uh, the Applegate Trail. It was actually the Stagecoach Road. Right, because the Applegate Trail came from Klamath into Ashland, down to Green Springs into Ashland. Green Springs. It's yeah. still a snake's back even now. Yeah. But what it was crooked. Then, yeah. Crooked as could be. Yeah. You know, um, I've been so lucky to hear you tell your family stories. Uh, because we did a show about the family that ended up in Talon, Phoenix area. Yeah. And that, what was their family name? Well, on, on my father's side, Bell, and on my mother's side, Job, just like Job in the Bible, J-O-B. So those people settled there. But now you're going to bring me stories. Well, uh, the, the Bell settled east of Talon, where there was no talent there, but that's where they settled. Sure. But the Jobs d didn't stop in the Rogue River Valley at all. They went right on through and right through Sunny Valley and right on up in the Willamette Valley to Vanita, which is 11 miles west of Eugene. And and my great granddad got a 360 acre land claim there. Ah, you can research this and find out just where that property is? Uh, yeah, I got a map of it and the, the number of the land claim and everything from the uh, Lane County Historical Society. And I, I never went and exactly loaded the, located the exact piece of property because he expanded a lot too. When he got here, he uh, he seen people throwing away a lot of furniture and stuff, you know. And sure. he was pretty business minded old fella. Or was a young man then, but so he got a neighbor to let him divert part of a creek by his place, and he put in a water wheel. And, and put in a thing he called an up and down saw. It was probably just a half of an old cross cutter whip saw and put it on a water wheel where to go up and down and he could cut oak lumber off of oak trees he'd cut down, small ones. And, and he made lumber and then he made furniture. And, and one of the main things that he made a lot of was because women had babies, you know. Yes. All the time having babies and they, so he made a lot of rocking chairs. And uh, and there's a little one-room school made into a museum in Vanita. And, and Betty and I went up there one time, and the lady that uh, takes care of it, she just opened by appointment. And so she said, well, she'd take us down there because she said there's a lot of Job family history in writing in that museum. And because and my Great granddad even donated a piece of land for a school. It was called the Job School, uh -huh. and she still has one of his rocking chairs there. It hangs from a buckskin string on a nail on the wall. She won't let nobody sit in it. But it's and he painted them black, and then whenever they killed an animal, they tanned the hide with the hair on, and he'd cut them and make a kind of a web seat in them, you know. Right, and, and that's a good seat, strong, yeah, strong. Right. You, and you, so. She did get it down and let me sit down in it so Betty could take my picture. <laughs> oh, I wish we had that picture oh, of you and your... I wish I had the chair. <laughs> you and Granddad's chair. Yeah. Well, but, uh, so anyhow, but but he later put in a, a little bigger water wheel and, and got his saw to where it would cut up to 300 feet a day. And it was considered, according to the to the Lane County Historical Society, the first sawmill in the state of Oregon with it, his little mill thing he had there cutting lumber to make furniture. Well, that's history, isn't that's it? That's right, and and he had money from it, and eventually when he died, he'd bought 
more land. He when he died, he had 805 acres. He accumulated quite a bit of land. That is wonderful. Yeah. Well, yeah. I I was so fortunate to go to the museum that is in uh, near, near Portland. It's Oregon City Museum. They have a wonderful uh, historic Oregon Trail Museum, and that was where I learned the story about the teapot. Oh now, yeah. I guess they'd take teapots like this. Yeah. Everybody knew they'd need one, but this was considered a luxury. Yeah. And so they said, sorry, we're only taking essentials on this one trip, uh, a Mormon trip. They only would take essentials. And the lady said, I will carry it from the whole way. So what she did, and her lid must have fit better than the one my husband brought from Japan. She took her um, apron string and tied the teapot to her waistband and walked to Oregon carrying a teapot. <laughs> I mean those pioneer women. If they yeah. really wanted something, they yeah. knew. Now you got a cowboy here. These are common here because they could heat them with on the fire, on coal fire. Ah, See, that's... this you had to put hot water in. That you could heat right on a bonfire, coal fire. A lot of them, this is more or less kind of like English. They put them in a coal fire. So uh, this made sense. In. This is pure luxury. That's right. <laughs> now, I used to have a, a friend, a, a real old lady out in the Applegate, and she is very Victorian-like. And once in a while, I go out there because I, I, a certain thing that she collected, occasionally I'd get things called rose bowls. Mm. And if I ever got one, I took it out to, to her. She always wanted to buy it. And, and she'd always want me, I don't even care for tea, but she'd always want me to stay for tea and I couldn't turn her down. And, and she would had the Victorian way of doing a teapot like this, English bone china cup, and if you're going to serve tea, pour hot tea in an English bonnet shine cup, she always put a sterling silver. Now, not just an ordinary spoon, but a sterling silver spoon. She laid it in the English bone china cup before she ever poured the tea in because the sterling absorbed the heat real fast. Otherwise, the heat might just pop an English bone <laughs> china cup. So she always put the sterling spoon in first. <laughs> oh, proper, proper Proper, lady. yeah, I'll say she was proper. <laughs> Some of the things that, that were essential, besides the teapot to heat water, would have been absolutely essential to pack one of these, right? Yeah, oh yeah. And take it down to the creek and put out a load of laundry. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking why the metal? With homemade soap. Sure. Oh, yeah, my grandma used to make soap all the time. What's your grandma's name? The, the, on my mother's side that made the soap, her, her name was Mary Elizabeth. Uh, I looked this up through my niece, but because I knew something was wrong, she always went by the name of Lida. And I thought, boy, if that was her name, that sure was a terrible name to name <laughs> her. But <laughs> she always went by that. But her name was actually Mary Elizabeth, which was, kind of, I thought, kind of a pretty name. Now, the reason that you'd have one of these on e almost every wagon, this was used for everything, right? Like a bath. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> it, what, once you'd bathe the dad and the kids, and yeah. then you'd use the same old water. You even water your animals with it. Sure. Yeah, water and trough. Essential, essential yeah. piece. Yeah, clothes, take a bath. And it, uh, it was, uh, had a lot of uses. And this is how it was done, folks. Yeah. Now, where is this picture taken? That's out that, in... that one taken right out at the museum on the wagon train days, it looks like. And the museum's name is? It is Applegate Trail Museum in Sunny Valley. It is a wonderful place. I mean, to take visitors, to take kids. Oh, what a... And if you go, I recommend you pack a picnic lunch because they have tables there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you might even pack it in a cloth bag and use some of the things that they might have had. Yeah. Home homemade bread. 
I don't right. know how they do that over a camp stove, but uh, the once a year, the Applegate family has a reunion. And I was so fortunate to go. This is out on the Applegate River at one of the Applegate cousins' home. Uh huh. And uh, this lady is an Applegate. She is the historian for their whole family. And is that Shannon? She just can tell you stories. But are, is her name Shannon Applegate? No, this lady's name is not Applegate now. Oh. Uh, she lives in. But is this on the Applegate River out here? Right, and people come from okay. all over to this. I understand next year they're having a, a reunion up north. Well, see, Shannon Applegate has the old Applegate house up at Yonkala, I think it is. Right. And one, about once a year, she opens that up to the public. Oh, I hope I get an invitation. She, she was, uh, she comes down to our last wagon train and give quite a speech. Well, it, it's just been so much fun to learn more about Applegate history. And when you go, in case you don't want to pack a picnic lunch and sit on the lawn, you can go to the Applegate store, yeah. Sunny Valley store. Yeah. I mean, it Except even... we call it the Covered Bridge store. Okay. Yeah. It's on the Applegate Trail. It's yeah. in Sunny Valley, yeah. and it is the Covered Bridge. Covered Bridge store. store. Let's yeah. talk Covered Bridge. Huh? Covered Bridge. Why yeah. Covered Bridge? Well, because of the Covered Bridge across Grays Creek. Famous. Yeah, famous. Just famous. Now, this is the Milo Covered Bridge, but it's similar. Yeah. You've had restoration. I understand Deb Potts, really. Yeah. He told me he even had yeah. found some of the original nails down in the creek. And, and give them to me, and I still got them. And, uh, and I got pictures of Deb's and I sitting on the back end of a covered wagon out in front of the covered bridge. <laughs> and if you can find it, I'd sure love to see yeah. that. Some, yeah, my son will be unpacking and get back to some of that stuff. But, yeah, Deb's. He was a good friend of oh, a lot yeah. of us. He He's loved history. Good man. He had a place big enough called Pottsville. Yeah. That he could keep all those things we wonder, you know, there's no room in the attic, what shall we do? He could keep it all. Now, this is in Merlin, and it's not an old, old building, but doesn't it look like one of the first pioneer homes that would have been built with the old bit long. Yeah, it's typical. But <laughs> the um, old wheel out there and everything. This is uh, is really a bakery, a wonderful, wonderful place. Mr. Feeders has. It's a what? A bakery. Oh yeah, the ba yeah, I brought bread there before. And it looks like it really belongs on the Applegate Trail. Yeah. Now, coming down. I understand when they got on the top of the Green Springs, you can still see grooves where those wagons. Yeah, part of I think part of the old Applegate Trail is visible in places up there, and of course they made a lot of tracks because most of the way down, brakes were locked, or sometimes they even put a pole through so it had turn up and hit the bed and lock them, or, and sometimes they even fell a small tree and hooked it on behind and drug it because it was so steep down out of there. And a horse might be in the back? No, they had the horses on the front holding they? them back. They, could, they still were able to hold back. Oxen couldn't hold back as well as horses could, but, but they drug trees behind them just to hold, and, and they locked the brakes and slid the wheels in real steep places, you know. When you go on that road, and if you've never been to Boxar Ranch, we're all welcome to go there. Easter, they invite everyone. Yeah. I heard it on the TV. Yeah, I've been there to Boxar. You actually can walk the Oregon Trail. Yeah. Now, we had a reenactment that came right through Grants Pass and... Yeah, the first one, first out, the first reenactment to come through here come from the box R on over through here. And and everything then too, a big watering place that's still over there is Tub Springs. It is. Yeah, you read a lot about Tub Springs in the old 
You'd recommend people read up on the Applegate and, and Trail. Tub Springs is still a tub running good water over there. I've drank out of it a lot of times myself. <laughs> oh, I better go find it's tubs. It's just ice cold. Now you got one of these lo guys who looks like he's just on the trail. He, he's a cowboy too. <laughs> he's got his hat and he's got his gun. Got his gun, yeah. He's, Who's this fella? That's my great great grandson, Caden Ryan Bell. Now. He's how many generations on the Oregon he's Trail? The, he's the seventh one. And you're the number? Oh, boy. Fourth? Uh, just a minute. My granddad, my dad. And then? Was, uh, no, I'm the third. And you're not a real young fellow, but you're still working no. hard, right? <laughs> yeah. How old are you? Eighty. Eighty years. Happy yeah. birthday to Thank you. Thank you. Now, out there in Sunny Valley, there's one more building that we haven't really talked about, and that is a restaurant open uh, Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, it's open Tuesday through Sunday now. Yeah, in the uh -huh. summer it'll be longer hours, but Wednesday through Sunday, you can get buffalo stew and buffalo burgers, burgers yeah. and just a lot of history. I mean, the room is just a uh, Oh, a treasure. Now, whose idea was it to have the Applegate Trail and the museum and to make well, that? That was, of course, Betty's idea because it, it first started through her mother. Her, when her mother was still alive, she's passed away now, but when she's still alive, she'd read up a lot about the Applegate Trail. And of course, they found out then that the house they lived in was right on the Applegate Trail. Ooh. So that started the uh, ball rolling and after her mother passed away, why Betty just carried it on. And and so Betty is really the one that's solely responsible for all the bringing to life the Applegate Trail history through this country because it was a forgotten story till she brought it to life. And, mm -hmm. and there's something I'd like to say for her today and hope that It'll be part of your little movie here, and she can hear it. Uh, today is her birthday, believe it or ah. not. Betty Galsta's birthday. Wow. Uh, no, I don't know. You can take it from here. This is a, in the 30 <laughs> years we've been friends, this is the second time she told me she's 29, so I don't know if <laughs> you have to figure that one out. <laughs> well, the museum has a number of aspects of, of theater, where you can actually see the reenactment. And then, of course, all those lovely uh, artifacts. And yeah, the displays really displays, look like yeah. you're just going through the trail. Yeah. And, uh, of course, a gift shop. But the uh, building out front, that was a school and a church and all sorts of things, huh? The old log building. Right. It, it was built actually for a Grange Hall. And, and then they done, had a lot of activities in it when it was the Grange Hall, you know. And then later they built a new Grange Hall uh, further up Grays Creek there. And the, the old building was just sitting there and, and yeah. Betty bought it and I had it moved over there and we kind of restored it. And, and, and now it gets all kinds of uses yet. They Including have- Including weddings. It's weddings, a, even had a couple of three funerals. And beginning in uh, Easter and Christmas and New Year's and uh, and uh, four service meetings and uh, this different and it uh, could be your family community your things family you know gather. huh it could be your family gathering too when you have a history oh yeah they've had family reunions there uh, yeah. this radio park which is just beyond there. And they have dreams to restore this. Why is it Radio Park? Well, because the people that originally had it years ago uh, had the first radio in Sunny oh. Valley. So everybody went there to hear it. Can't it's you a, just a real imagine oddity. after a hard day's work, you'd go down and sit on the front porch and, and listen, listen to the radio. <laughs> aprons, what were they used for? What's that? This apron? apron? Keep your clothes clean. <laughs> right. I, do you, I remember my mother out gathering things. Vegetables. Yeah. Oh, Mom always went to the garden with an apron and come back with it 
and lettuce and beets and radishes and everything else. And No wonder this apron's dirty. Yeah, the only time she ever dropped it all was once she'd picked a big head of lettuce and it little garter snake was curled up under there and she got about halfway <laughs> up with all her vegetables and the snake popped out and she <laughs> dropped her apron and let everything go fly. <laughs> oh, I would do the same myself. <laughs> hear a scream clear up the house. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm so glad you came back and told us more stories about your pioneer family. And you're now... Well, uh, see the Jobs, my great granddad was named James Job. He was born in 1814 and died up in, at Benita in 1885, 71 years old. He, he didn't, li didn't make it so long, but my great-grandmother, who had to walk like all women from Missouri, they come from Missouri out here, and uh, her name was Safrina Job, and she was born in 1821 and lived till 1912. She was 91 years old. Oh, and Safrina's the one with such that a pretty... had 12 name. kids. Five of them lived and, or died, and seven of them lived. And one of the kids was my granddad. His name was Marion Job. And, and, then, and he was born on my great-granddad's old homestead, and he homesteaded in 52. My granddad was born there in 1857. That was still two years before he could become a state. Well, you mentioned the grave, and Grave Creek is known for a grave for Miss. Yeah, because Lady. of Martha Lynn LaCrowley. She, well, she, she had, she got typhoid fever on the way out here because they're coming across the Black Rock Desert. They wasn't accustomed to the distance and the. Sure. lack of water and and they was drinking what about ever they could find and a lot of people not a lot of people but quite a few contacted they called it mountain fever then but it was nothing more than typhoid fever oh and and, and, and she she got it and and she died right up the top of mount sexton and, and now you can go right there at graves creek they, they went across the creek there and and the fellow young fellow she was going to marry made a Took a bunch of, they was getting pretty short of everything. He knocked some wagon parts apart, beds and some boxes and made a casket for her and buried her there. Well, thank you so much for being my guest. We ran out of time. We I'm Bernie time. Martin Beck saying bye for now. Tune in for history. You are history, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay.